Hello, everyone. I'm Kelly Eversoll, the Executive Director of the International Wheat Genome Sequencing Consortium, and I want to welcome you to our webinar series. And we're very fortunate today to have Nicola Adamski from the John Innes Center with us, who's going to be talking about a cloning project um, of, in Triticum pollinicum. So before we do that, I'll give you a quick overview of the International Wheat Genome Sequencing Consortium. So we have, we're an international consortium and we have um, over 3,300 members and we're in 71 countries and have 914 institutes and companies who work in wheat and are part of our community. We want to thank our 10 sponsors, which have made it possible for us to have this webinar series, as well as for us to continue trying to coordinate um, wheat projects internationally and to advance genomic tools for wheat. We are, after the publication of the reference sequence, we launched our, or revised our vision um, to enhance breeding through an increased understanding of the molecular basis of traits and their allelic diversity. And it's this vision that's kind of on tar target for our talk today, which is really uh, trying to help us understand and to advance the molecular basis of traits. So our activities this year is that we are working to uh, expand our collaborations with wheat genomic tool developers to ensure the community has all of the tools that they need in, their, in the wheat toolbox. We're also uh, publishing a clear process for contributing how, you, how the community can contribute to manual and functional annotation. We are also still trying to get uh, reference sequences of at least eight land races that represent the breadth of wheat diversity um, and, and really cover the entire, uh, the global wheat diversity and not just one region. Um, and then we are, of course, continuing our efforts to encourage pre-publication releases of genome sequences for both elite varieties and for other genomic resources. And as I mentioned, our, our webinar series, which we're now into year three of that. Uh, just a reminder, our next webinar is at the end of March, and it will be uh, with on the evolution of recombination landscapes and diverging populations of bread wheat. You can already register for this webinar by clicking on this link, and uh, which you will have in your PDFs, or you can also uh, go to the IWGSC website. So just a, a quick explanation to, or reminder of what the dashboard is. Uh, the dashboard, you can put all your questions in the question panel. Uh, don't put them in the chat because I don't won't see that, but please do put them in the question in the Q&A panel as we go along, and we'll get to those uh, as soon as the presentation is over. And for any questions we don't get to, then Nikolai has agreed to answer those questions uh, in writing afterwards. Um, you can, as I mentioned, you can already download the handouts from, the, from both my presentation, which that gives you the, the links, as well as Nicola's presentation. So just a reminder, the webinar is recorded and will be posted on the IWGSC YouTube channel, and you can subscribe to the channel so you never miss a new upload. So with that, I'd like to welcome now Nikolai Adamski from the John Innes Center, and he's, his, his talk is titled Solving a 100-Year-Old Mystery, Cloning the P1 Locus in Triticum pollinicum. Nicola, thank you very much for being with us today, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay. Right. Okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, it's, it's my great pleasure to, uh, to have been selected to give the webinar 
uh, in the IWGC series. And as Kelly mentioned today, I want to talk about uh, a cloning project that we undertook. And uh, it has to do with this uh, strange looking species of, of weed, Triticum polonicum. And here, here on the screen, you can see two, two different accessions of, of polonicum with, with sort of uh, close ups in, in the center. And what's the most striking feature about, about this uh, weed is that it has these very elongated glooms and lemmas. So if you look, for example, here at this one from, from the side, you actually don't see any of the other florets or the spike is completely hidden, which usually in a, in a, in a regular weed, you, 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 you could see them better. This is something that was recognized uh, very early on that, you know, uh, in uh, horticultural drawings, uh, people accentuated these, uh, these, these fin types very strongly. Um, and already in 1905, uh, Roland Biffin, who's, who's actually the namesake for, uh, or the, the patron of my, of my department here at the Journalist Center, he created a segregated population between a rivet weed and uh, the species treating polonicum. And uh, he, well, his, his data his data here on the screen, because it's, it, it might not be visible very well, I've, I took the liberty and, and recreated it in, in, in stronger colors. And what, what, he, what he found was that uh, this, this trait, the, the, the gloom bend, seemed to be controlled by, by a single locus uh, as, as he got like three uh, segregation groups. He had a roughly one, one, to, one to two to one uh, segregation ratio. So this was already more, more than 100 years, years ago. There was interest in species and, and over the years, uh, people have contributed more, more and more information, but uh, exactly what, what the P1 locus was, whether it was one gene, several genes, well, whether it was several genes, maybe one location, we didn't know. Um, throughout the seminar, I will use some, some terminology. So, so I just want to briefly go, go over this uh, with you. So uh, this is a, a spike of wheat or something called, called ear. And then it's it is made up of of uh, many different uh, spikelets, so the smaller utens, and it and uh, a spikelet is subtended at the bottom by by two glooms. So these are uh, bract-like structures that are not flower bearing. And then a spikelet uh, uh, has several flowers or florets, uh, which consists of two sheathing structures, the lemma and the palea. Uh, and inside those sheathing structures, you find the uh, the reproductive ones, so, so first carpels and anthers, and then later on the, the grain. Now spikelets, so uh, for, for, for this study, we looked at the composition of the spikelet in a little bit more detail. So uh, we, we tend to dissect the spikelets in, into, into its various uh, components. So for example, we, we look at, uh, at the individual florets because uh, to, to see if uh, our phenotypes are, are different for, for different florets. So uh, usually the, the, the first florid is, is the one at, at the base and then uh, the next opposite florid will be the second florid and so on and so forth. Um, the glooms are not part of the florid, uh, but, it is, but it, they are different. So uh, it's, if, you, if you measure gloom length, it is worthwhile to, to, to record which, which gloom subtends the, the first floor and the second floor because you can actually see differences uh, in, in size between these. Okay, now this project started uh, a long while ago and was initiated by um, a research uh, assistant in, in the lab, James Simmons. And we had some uh, triticum polonicum, so this is uh, another picture, growing the glasses for a diversity study. And he was just interested, so what was it made up? So he, he made a cross between this uh, tetraploid species and a hexaploid UK variety called, called Paragon. So this is, uh, this is a fairly standard variety that we use for, for, for a lot of our uh, genetics work. Um, and without any markers, he, he continued backcrossing uh, his, his initial cross to the, the hexaploid pen, to the Paragon, and also selecting for long blooms. If you remember, as, as Biffen had already shown more than 100 years ago, uh, the heterozygous, heterozygous lines can be easily distinguished, distinguished by the gloom band from a wild type line. So without markers, he, he just kept selecting for, for long gloom lines, back crossing to Paragon, and he created BC4 and eventually BC6 uh, neosogenic lines. 
And then so when we started looking, when we started analyzing the, the fields, so, so, so these are images from, from BC4 line. So uh, we could see that, yes, indeed, um, our uh, wild type like line, which we call P1 wild type, uh, has sort of like a, a normal, normal looking gloom, whereas the uh, polonicum neostrogen line, which we call P1 pole, uh, has an elongated gloom uh, about uh, three, four millimeters longer. And you can see that the spikes also look uh, looks like different. So the uh, the wild type the spikes tend to be slightly uh, wider, whereas in the polonicum they, they, they tend to be uh, more close. So the, the angle of the spike is is, is, is wider in, in in the wild type, which you can also see here. So this is uh, a wild type spikelet and the spike from the polonicum mill, and you can see the uh, the glooms are sort of uh the angle of the glooms to to like an imaginary central line is, is is wider and we we took these neosogenic lines uh both the backcross four and when it was available the backcross six lines as well and we grew them in the field in six environments over five years uh to evaluate if if other traits were also so polonicum is not only known for its long glooms but also its long grains which which is why it's very important so here is is uh, exemplary pictures of, of, of grains from the uh, from our nils, the wild type nil and the polonicum nil. And indeed, in, in, in all these trials, we could consistently see that uh, the grain length was significantly enlarged in the uh, polonicum nil versus the wild type. And this led to an increase in 1,000 grain weight, so about 5% longer grains and 5.5% increase in grain weight. However, the, the yield across the years was was neutral, so it wasn't it was negative, but we also didn't, didn't see an, uh, a positive net effect. And we are very fortunate that, uh, especially in recent years, the Jordan Center has invested a lot in our field capacities and uh, lately commissioned uh, construction of a new field station, which which helped greatly in all in all these efforts. In addition to to these filters, you also see some pleiotropic effects. So, for example, we see that the uh, the the height, the plant height, is increased in the uh, polonicum estrogen line. So by around six centimeters or um, like two inches, I'd say. Um, and this is driven by by increase in uh, in spike length and uh, the peduncle, so the final uh, the, the the final internode uh, stem. And we also notice a, a slight reduction in, in heading time. So the polonicum nil heads about 0.8 days later than than, than the wild type. And this material has has, has gone into uh, into our UK pre-breeding program, which is called the Breeders Toolkit. Um, all the data and and, and more, so, so so more traits that, that we that we uh, uh, measured are available in, in in our in our publication, which I think will be uh, linked uh, below. Okay, but now, okay, so so we established that our neosogenic lines are. Uh, do have the, the, the long gloom uh, phenotype, they have long grains, so they are interesting. So what, what we'd, we'd like to map the P1 locus. And uh, when we started, uh, the markers that we had, so they were uh, axial markers, so they were really snip markers, but they were ordered by uh, genetically uh, by this method called, called POPSeq. And so when we, uh, so this is an example map. So we have uh, here, the uh, so Paragon is, is actually our, uh, uh, neosogenic line with, uh, with the wild type background, and polonicum is the neosogenic line with the uh, polonicum uh, introgression. And so we've, we've, <clears throat> we've run a couple of, uh, of markers. We ordered them by, uh, by the centimorg distance or the, the uh, projected centimorg distance and uh, got, got maps. And what was prominent was that our phenotype was always linked to, uh, to this one marker here, 22435. Um, and we're really, uh, Really happy in, in one sense that, for example, we had we had a flanking marker already here at what was projected 99.25 centimorg, so less than a centimorg distant, distal. Um, and we just and we thought like, ah, oh, we, we just need to add another marker sort of uh, up, upstream of here, and, and hopefully we get we get a very short mapping it as well. But we also a bit uh, troubled because we had we had a lot of sort of what what seemed to be uh, double combinations in a, in a fairly small small space, and we're wondering if there might be an inversion hiding. So we, we prepared for, for, for the worst when we, when we embarked on the mapping. But luckily, very soon, soon after, we, we got access to uh, 
the very first iteration of the of the new RefSeq uh, genome assembly uh, spearheaded by the IWC, uh, which which gave us the physical locations of our markers. And when we when we ordered our markers by by the physical position, we realized that the sentiment position and the physical position did not always uh, agree very, very well. And so you can see that, for example, one, one of the markers, which uh, genetically was, was mapped only like seven centimorgans distal to, uh, to our linked link marker, well, nine, nine centimorgans, uh, the physical distance was actually vast. So there was uh, quite, quite a big, big span between, between these two markers. And we now look at, looked at our recombinant map. The map looked a lot, a lot nicer. So we, we didn't have these, these strange uh, double recombination events. Uh, we, we do have some here, but, but given the large distances, this, 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 this could be expected. Um, but suddenly we, we went from a small uh, centimorgan interval to a 420 megabase in interval. And that shows you the, the, the power that the genome reference uh, can impose, how, how difficult mapping projects are if you simply rely on uh, genetic distances. So yeah, our huge interval. So using using our uh, BC4 and, and later BC6 uh, recombinants, we are lucky that, that we could we could narrow down this this interval. So uh, we're able to find recombinants that were much closer to, to our linked markers, and we ended up with a roughly uh, five megabase uh, interval from around 126 to 100. Let's say 30 was was our flank uh, me megabases, so five megabase interval. And uh, we designed lots, lots of new markers using using the genome reference, and uh, could assess our, our neosogenic lines again. And here in, in, in the bottom, you, you see uh, again our neosogenic lines, uh, the wild type in blue, the polonicum neosogenic line in uh, this, this orange color. Uh, and here on the right, you see the associated glue blend. So the wild type line has a, a sort of wild type like phenotype, so about nine, nine to 10 millimeter glooms. And the polonicum is about 12 to 13 uh, millimeter. And we started looking at our recombinants, and uh, we found that, okay, uh, we have a recombination event between th these two markers. We don't know exactly where, where it is. Uh, but this line, for example, has, it has blue all across this interval, so wild type, and also has the wild type phenotype. Uh, this line has a recombination uh, at, at the other end of, of our initial interval. Uh, so it's uh, orange across most of it, and it shares the, the polonic phenotype. And this way, with uh, with our recombinants, we're able to uh, narrow down our interval to uh, between these two markers, uh, highlighted in green, so S15, S, S, S19. Now, one, one thing to mention is that uh, a bunch of our recombinants here that have uh, the wild type sequence upstream of our green interval, their gloom length is slightly decreased to, to, to lines that are uh, orange all, all across. So which suggests there might be there might be additional uh, minor QTL uh, that affect uh, the gloom length up, upstream of uh, of this interval. Now it's green interval, so 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 this is the continuation. So so these were the, the two green markers. It actually spanned a very small interval, just just 50 kilobase uh, pairs. And the majority of this, when we looked in the, in the reference sequence, uh, was uh, transposable elements, so shown here in, in these, with these gray boxes. And it incorporated only a single gene fully, and the last exon of, of, another, of another gene. And when we sequenced, uh, sorry, <laughs> I've went too fast. So we sequenced uh, this, this last exon, so all, all everything from, from this gene uh, in, in, in our lines, and we couldn't find any polymorphism, so we discarded this gene as, as, as a candidate, leaving only uh, this gene model here, trace here, 7A02G175200. And uh, we, we, we sequenced our, um, our uh, polonicum yesterday line and compared it to reference assembly, and we included uh, around two and a half KB upstream of the, of the promoter, which, which included uh, a bit of repetitive element. Uh, as well as one, one KB or a little bit over one, one KB uh, downstream of the of the of the final exon, and the only polymorphism that we could find was located in the first intron uh, of of the gene. So in the, in the wild type, we have the sequence in, in, in blue, which is 
completely absent and replaced by another sequence uh, much shorter. So, so this sequence is completely gone and set replaced by, by this uh, 160 base per sequence. And very shortly after, uh, after so uh, many other people reported cloning, uh, identifying the same gene with the same polymorphism uh, in different accessions of, of, of treating polonicum. And I have the, the um, uh, citations listed, listed below. So that was very encouraging that uh, it, not, not just us, but other people also discovered the same gene. Now, what, what, what is this gene? So uh, it's, it's a member of the uh, short vegetative phase or SVP uh, family. And it had been previously called uh, vegetative reproductive transition two in a study that was looking at uh, vernalization and, 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 the, and, and the time it takes to uh, go from a, a vegetative meristem to a reproductive meristem. So that's where it got its, its, its name from. And so uh, we've designated the wild type allele as via 2 a2a, so VRT A2A, and the uh, uh, allele from polonicum is VRT A2B. So we'll use these, these names throughout the, uh, the, the talk. Now, one question that we had, so, so what, what is the sequence that uh, appeared in the VRT A2B allele? Again, highlighted here in, in this orange color. When we did a, a, a BLAST search, the closest uh, hit we, we, we got, which was uh, around 70% uh, coverage of the sequence with 75% identity, was to a moth, uh, the cetaceous Hebrew character. So uh, suggesting and th that this sequence is just something completely different. We also, we also tried blasting it against uh, 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 databases for repetitive elements and, and, and just against the, the uh, genome assembly itself. But it didn't seem to be a repetitive sequence, so we we, we wondered what what exactly it was. And when we looked at it in a little bit more detail, we noticed uh, two sequences flanking uh, this this orange sequence upstream and downstream. And when we when we did analysis, we we, we realized that uh, this sequence downstream occurs one, one, once more in in this orange sequence with the addition of so, so there's an AGT uh, repeat. Uh, and, and, and downstream, there's, there are three copies, and, and here there are four. And the majority of, of this 160 uh, base pairs is actually comprised of repeating units of this uh, of the sequence that you find uh, five prime of it. So here there's, there's, a, there's a TT pair inside. Uh, this one lacks of this, this pink sequence. Uh, this one has the, the white sequence cut off. So you, you see that they're kind of units. So um, based on, on um, uh, studies in, in, in yeast and, and mammals, uh, there's a, a repair mechanism suggested. So when, when a double strand break occurs, there's a chance that uh, a, a pathway called the alternative non-homologous enjoining or ANHEJ pathway works. And this, this pathway uh, is, is, is known to include uh, flanking sequences to fill uh, gaps made, made, made by a double strand break. So while we don't have direct evidence, while we don't have any like uh, full proof to, uh, to to substantiate this, I think it's a likely, likely hypothesis that this is what happened, that a, a double strand break occurred uh, and the repair mechanism did an absolute horrible job and just tried to fill in uh, the sequence using using some flanking sequence. So this this makes this a very a very rare mutation. So we wanted to, to understand how how widespread is this mutation? Do we find it in other germplasm? So um, Tritical polonicum being a tetraploid line, we, we first started looking at other tetraploid germplasm. So uh, we looked at uh, Dicocoides or white emma and uh, durum wheat, which traditionally have normal size, size glooms uh, signified by, by this N. And all the polonicum accessions that, that we have show, show the long gloom phenotype. And we were screened for the presence of, of the wild type or polonicum sequence in, in the first intro. We found that none of our 70 dicocoidus accessions and none of our although limited durum accessions uh, show, showed the polonicum allele and, and said all, all of them had, had the wild type whereas uh, all 36 polonicum sessions that were screened exclusively had the same uh, 160 base pair uh, rearrangement in the first intron. We also we also looked at in hexaploid germplasm so we, we looked at uh, both land traces and uh, cultivars uh, 
And again, all of these had or were reported to have normal sized glooms. And likewise, all of them had actually the uh, wild type sequence in the, in, in the first intron. Now, through the literature, we learned that there, there were some uh, hexaploid accessions that have actually uh, long glooms. Uh, notably, there's uh, uh, within the, a collection of, of land races uh, from Portugal, so these were collected, I think, in the 1950s. Uh, from the Aranzada region. Uh, this is why this, these land races, uh, where these land races derive the name from. Uh, they, they were a part of long glooms, as well as, as another hexapod species called Triticum petropavlovsky, uh, which, uh, which was discovered in the Xinjiang province in, in China. And when we grew up the plants, we could verify, yes, all of them actually have, have long glooms, even longer glooms than our um, hexaploid neosogenic line. And when we genotype them for, uh, for, for, for presence of, um, of, the, of the alleles, we found that all of them have exclusive to the VRTA to B allele, so with the 160 base pair rearrangement. And again, this was shown by, by, by several other independent studies that have been conducted in parallel. Now, what um, we wanted to understand so what, what makes the sequence in the first intro special? So uh, we aligned uh, the sequence of the first intron of the VRTA2 gene uh, across other, other grass species, including barley, brachypodium, uh, rice, maize, and sorghum. And we found that across the, the first intron, conservation is fairly low. But within these 563 base pairs from the uh, wild type sequence, we found there are actually two peaks uh, that are conserved across across these distant uh, species, suggesting that there's a, there's an evolutionary mechanism that this that uh, makes these sequences conserved. Uh, and we defined uh, we defined these two sequences as, as motifs. Obviously, they they are quite long. Uh, traditionally, like motifs for transcription factors tend to be shorter, but uh, these are essentially the the sequences that are conserved, and they are completely absent from from triticum polonicum, so from the A to B uh, allele. Now, I mentioned motifs, transcription factors. Uh, this led us to think, so, okay, so maybe these motifs change uh, the expression pattern of, of, of this gene. So uh, we, we looked at uh, developing uh, meristems of wheat, so at, at, at different time points. So we looked at the uh, vegetative meristems, where the meristem only produces leaves, uh, a double rich state, where and this is a, a fairly late double rich state. Uh, where spike meristem and, and leaf meristem uh, uh, are present uh, through to lemma promodium, floral promodium, and the terminal spikelet. And we can see then in the in our in the wild type neosogenic line, uh, the VRTA2 gene is is, fair, is 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 well expressed at the vegetative stage, and then gradually is being is being turned turned off, switched off. When we look at the uh, neosogenic line from Polonicum. We see that the gene is also very highly expressed in the vegetative stage, much, much higher than, than in the wild type meal, and it fails to be switched off. So even at these later stages, uh, expression is, is, is similar to what it is uh, in the vegetative stage in, in the wild type. So again, this suggests that the motifs that are deleted from the A to B allele uh, are binding sites for repressors of BRTA2 transcription. And uh, one of the other papers uh, I, mean, I mentioned, one of the other parallel studies for Leo 2021, uh, they did a lot of uh, lot more work uh, on uh, the, the regulation there. So I uh, I urge you to to to, to have a look uh, look at that. And they they confer with sort of this uh, uh, assessment that indeed yes, these motifs there is something that acts as uh, binding sites for repressors. Okay, but what about our glooms? So our glooms are Elongated between between the neosogenic lines. How does expression? What does expression look like? And we looked at two uh, time points: uh, mid boot stage and late boot stage. And actually, in the wild type, we found no no expression uh, of, of of the gene. Whereas in, in in the in the neosogenic line with the polynomial introgression, we found fairly high uh, levels of expression. So at, at this mid boot stage, it's it's ridiculously highly expressed, much much higher than actin than our actin controls even. 
So uh, this was suggested uh, expression levels and organ size are maybe correlated because we have, we have an increase in, in organ size. At the same time, we, 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 have, a, we have an increase in, in transcription. So we looked at, uh, at, at, at another organ, so this, these are lemmas. And we looked at uh, lemmas from, uh, this is a combination of florid one and two and florid four. And again, uh, in the wild type so this is at anthesis. The white template shows no expression whatsoever of the gene. Uh, whereas in the uh, polonicum yastogenic lines, we do see expression in, in both. And again, based, based on what we've seen in, uh, from the globes, we'd expect that, okay, uh, we have expression of the gene, so we'd expect to see uh, an increase in, in size of these organs. So uh, we looked at lots of, lots of spikes, we dissected them. Uh, so we have, there's a representation of a spike here on the left. And the data is ordered uh, by the position. So here at the bottom is, is data from the most basal spikelet. Uh, at the top is data from the most uh, apical spikelet. Uh, the blue lines are, are, are the median values uh, uh, for size. So this is uh, lemma length. And the uh, uh, ribbon is the interquartile range. And you can see that independent of spikelet position, so where, where we are on, on the spike, uh, the polonicum neosogenic line has much, much longer lemmas uh, than the wild type line in, in, uh, in the position of florid one. If you look at the second florid, this still holds true, although the, the difference is now a, a lot a lot smaller. It's still significant, but, but you, can, you, you can easily see that uh, the lemmas are no, not, not quite as long as, as in florid one. If you go to the first florid, um, in, in, in this data set, we, we still have a uh, significant difference in, in organ size, although we've, we've seen other um, uh, other times, uh, the, there might be no significant difference in, 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 the, in, the, in the third florid uh, for lemma length. And once we get to, to the fourth florid, we actually see no, no difference whatsoever anymore. So despite uh, high levels of expression of the VIA2A2 gene in these florids. Wow, so that was puzzling. So uh, to summarize, what, what, what we see is if we look at the cross section of, of a spikelet, uh, we see that, uh, so uh, we have a, a bloom subtending, we have a lemma palea enclosing uh, a florid, the carpal and anthers and, and lodicules. So what we see is that uh, we have a strong effect of, of the gene on uh, outer layers of, of a florid. So the glooms are elongated, the lemmas are elongated. Uh, I haven't shown it, but uh, we actually don't see any, any difference in palea size and neither on, on, on carpal or, or anther size. So uh, outerlying organs seem to be affected more, more strongly than inner ones. At the same time, we also see a difference uh, in length uh, in a, on an uh, apical basal scale. So the, the organs at the, at the base of a, of a spikelet are more strongly affected. So float one, float two, float three, yeah, sometimes, sometimes not. Once we get to float four, we don't see any, any difference. So outer and basal organs have shown show the strongest effect. Instead of uh, outer and inner apical and basal, we can also think, think about this as old and young in terms of uh, when the uh, spike meristem develops, uh, the glooms are one, are one of the first organs that is being uh, initiated and differentiates from, from the meristematic tissue. And the lemma is the second one. And th these other ones, the palia, the carpal, the, uh, the anthers, th they come later. So it's possible that uh, <clears throat> there's a specific window in which uh, the gene can act on, on, on these, on these uh, tissues and organs. And once that window is closed, uh, it, there's, there's no effect regardless of, of um, uh, level of expression. Now, as, 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 as final proof that we actually found, found the correct gene, uh, we, we did the complementation study. Uh, we did this in the Hexploit cultivar fielder. And we, we transformed the VIA2A to B allele, so the, the whole genomic sequence. So the first exon, the polonicum uh, substitution, all the other exons, uh, under control of the native promoter. So, so, so not ubiquitin, but just the VRTA2 native promoter. And uh, this was done here at the General Center uh, by a fantastic transformation team, uh, Shadia and Mark, who, who used uh, an open source method for, for transformation. So this is not Japan tobacco, uh, but, but very open source. Uh, I, I recommend that, that, that you look at the paper if you if if, if you want to um, uh, 
work more on, on transformation, maybe improve the transformation efficiencies. Uh, it's, it's, it's a really nice thing. So we transformed FIDA with, with, with this big, big chunk of sequence. And uh, we classed our, uh, the transgenic lines, uh, we put them into four classes. So we recovered plants that went through the uh, regeneration process, but lacked any uh, transgene. So we call these zero, zero copy uh, lines. So they have no transgene inside. Uh, we also have a low copy line. So, so any lines with one or two copies of the transgene, we classify as low. Medium was anything between uh, three and, and, and five copies. And the high copy lines was uh, se se seven plus copies of the transgene. And you can already see from, from these pictures of, of, of the spike list that uh, it's very striking in, in the high copy lines that we have elongated glooms, glooms and lemmas. If we quantify this, uh, so we're looking at gloom length uh, and, and the copy numbers, we see that uh, low, medium, and high uh, copy number lines have significantly longer glooms than zero. Uh, the difference between lo low and medium are not are not significant, but but uh, uh, again, the high copy line has a significantly has significant elongated glooms compared to the other uh, to the low and medium copy lines. Now, copy number is not that's not a good uh, measure because you can have transgenes that actually lie in the, in, the, in the region of the gene that is not accessible, so they don't actually contribute to expression. So we also measured uh, expression of the gene, and we, we, we found a very strong correlation between uh, uh, expression and uh, the length of, of, of the glooms. And even if we remove this, this, this slightly out outlying uh, data point here, the, the uh, correlation is still significant. So uh, what, what it shows us is that, yes, indeed, we did uh, clone the correct uh, gene and that the gene is acting in a dosage-dependent manner, which, again, it could be said that it, it might be obvious just, just from the early genetics that were done 100 years ago when, when, when Biffen saw that uh, his F2 was segregating 1 to 2 to 1. Um, there was a suggestion that maybe dosage play, plays a role in it, but this, this is actually very good evidence and, indeed. Uh, it matters how many transcripts of the gene you you have. Now, if you look at uh, the SVP genes, so uh, in in grasses there has been a, a, a triplication. So we actually have three uh, families of, of SVP genes. So we have the uh, the family that VAT two belongs to, uh, and and another two two sets of families. And we look in the literature actually. We found that uh, there were actually uh, many examples from from other species where SPP members have also been shown to cause elongated glooms and lemmas. Uh, so, so this was in maize and rice and barley. And again, there's uh, there's the citations uh, below. And just to exemplify, so the phenotype that we observed with the VRTA to B is, is very reminiscent of, of of some of these. So, so this is an example uh, from maize. This is uh, so at the top you have a, a wild type E of maize. Uh, with, with its nice kernels. At the bottom, you have a, uh, an, an old land race uh, called potcorn. And you actually cannot see the kernels because uh, usually the, so maize is very, has a very different architecture to, to wheat, but it still produces uh, glooms and lemmas and palias, but they are sort of hidden un underneath. So once you, once you eat through your cup, cup of maize, the stuff that sticks between your teeth or is left, left in the cup, that's, that's basically all, all these issues, the, the glooms, the lemmas, the palia. And here in podcast, we actually have an elongation of, of, of the glooms, which completely cover, cover the grains. So there's still grains underneath, but they're completely enveloped by, uh, by these glooms. And uh, the reason behind this was that uh, this SVP gene in maize, uh, ZMM19, was duplicated, and there was a promoter rearrangement in, in the gene. So it's also, again, a very complex, uh, uh, complex polymorphism. And the result was that, again, in the wild type, um, at this late stage, we actually have no expression of, of the ZMM19 gene, but in the uh, podcorn, in the podcorn years, we actually have ectopic expression of the gene. So again, SVP is ectopic expression, Bloomland. So it's a very reminiscent uh, story. Uh, if, if we look at, at the homologs of, of ZMM19, uh, ZMM19 in wheat, we have, uh, we have the SVP1 clade of genes, so SVP A1, B1, D1. And interestingly, we, uh, a very talented PhD in the lab, Andy, Andy Chen, 
he was uh, he was working on on another land trace or another land trace, another subspecies of weed called Triticum espehanicum, which also has elongated blooms. Uh, and he made crosses. He made several populations. Uh, and what he found was that uh, another SVP member, so this SVP A1, which again is, is a homologue of the maize uh, ZMM19, is linked to the long bloom phenotype of uh, Trismus panicum. And when he looked for polymorphisms, he discovered a deletion and promoter of the gene. So uh, this is the 5 prime ETR. Uh, here we have the, the wild type SVP A1 sequence. Uh, and again, he, he did the comparison between uh, across different grasses and he identified these, these three motifs which are missing in the uh, uh, SVP allele from Triticum panicum. And what's very interesting, if again, if we look at maize, so maize also has uh, the maize wild type ZMM19 sequence has these three motifs, so it shares these. Um, whereas the, the tunicate allele, allele lacks these. So uh, it's very compelling evidence that, uh, again, uh, a, a modification of um, uh, of motifs that, that lead to a change in expression uh, is, is, is conserved across a, a fairly a fairly uh, large uh, um, evolutionary distance. And uh, Andy Andy has has recently uploaded his his, his images to uh, BioArchive, so I urge you to, to to have a look at it. So in general, we we would say that transcription levels of SVPs are really essential for spike development. Uh, a study from uh, Ben Travaskis in 2007 showed that, so this is uh, wild type barley, if they overexpress, uh, this is the, S the ZMM19 homolog in barley, uh, HVS SVP1, if they overexpress it with a, a ubiquitin promoter, uh, the spike actually produces vegetative tissues, so just, just more leaves. So it's, it's a phenotype called floral reversion. This was also recently shown by uh, Kun Lee, who's, who's, who's working in uh, George Lukowski's group uh, at, at UC Davis. Uh, they transformed uh, Kronos, which is a, a tetrapodurum line, where, with a, a ubiquitin VAT2 uh, uh, transgene. And they recovered different transgenic lines with uh, different uh, phenotypes. So uh, this line here looks very uh, similar to uh, our polonicum genic line. Uh, and you can see that the, the glooms and lemmas are, are much much more elegant in this one, and, and even more ridiculous in, in this line. And with uh, they they could link this to transcription activity. So as as we go from left to right, expression of the gene increases, and uh, you essentially move from um, you essentially get to a similar state as as, as, as here in barley, where so there's these these plants uh, th this line is where they produce maybe one or two seeds, but, but most of the time, actually, actually none. So the regulation of these SVPs is really important. So a little bit is okay, but too much of a good thing. And yeah, you, you mess things up too, too, too much. So uh, just to summarize, so uh, SVPs play a crucial role in grass spec development. So I've shown you examples from, from our research and, and research done by, by others. Um, and what's interesting is the, the Core functional regulation of, of these genes, so uh, motifs, be it in promoter sequences or intron sequences, uh, seem to be conserved between actually distance related grasses. So, again, this shows how, uh, how important the function is to uh, spike or panicle development, whichever species you're, you're looking at. And in all these studies, we, we can see that these SVPs they, they act in a dosage dependent manner. So, uh, the place and time of, of, of the expression is very crucial to. Uh, to what the final phenotype is. So again, going from, if if you have too much at, at the wrong time, you end up with these with these very sick plants that actually don't form any grains anymore and just just have leaves, 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 leaves. But at the same time, uh, the the research uh, that the return shows that modulating the expression pattern of the SVPs does hold potential to improve agronomic traits. So we just have to tweak it the the, the, the right way. Going forward for, for us, uh, we want to understand more about these, these motifs in the first entry of BRT2. So, for example, we want to understand if, if loss of one or both of these motifs from the wild type sequence uh, is necessary for the polonicum phenotype. And we understand which, which proteins bind by these motifs. So, what, what are the repressors that, that bind these motifs? In addition, we also want to um, elucidate the genetic networks surrounding BRT2. So, uh, again, upstream regulators, but also downstream targets. So, what's what, what is it regulating? 
And with that, I'd like to thank you for, for listening. And I, um, I'd like to thank everyone involved, involved in the work. I've mentioned uh, people as we, as we went through. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, John Linden Center for, for hosting us, for providing many good resources, investing in, in, in the research uh, on site. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Cora I, uh, who, who funded the research. I'd like to thank the IWGC uh, for giving me the chance to, to present my work to you. And I'd like especially to thank uh, the gene banks that provided the uh, material that, that we use for, for our um, uh, studies. So uh, the uh, GRU unit here at the Journal Center, the IPK Gene Bank, the USDA uh, National uh, Small Grade Collection, and CGN Wachening. Uh, without the efforts of, of, of conserving weird and wacky varieties of, of, of weed and, and, and species, we, we could not have done this work. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank you and uh, open up the floor for, for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola. A very interesting presentation, and I love the historical aspects of this. Uh, so just a reminder to everyone, you can put any questions into the Q&A panel at this time, and we'll try to get to them. Uh, so I, I do have a question uh, that, that came up uh, when you were first talking about the 100 years ago, looking at it. How, how, how did they actually identify that it was on a specific chromosome at that point in time? So, so that was done in the 1950s, actually, by um, uh, a, a Japanese science team. Uh, so uh, I, I believe that there was around the time of, 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 of early Sears and um, yeah. so they, they were able to, they, they didn't know exactly which chromosome, but they, they sort of, they knew that, oh, it's, it's chromosome 15, whatever it is, right? Hmm. Uh, uh, so the actual localization to, to specific chromosomes, in this case 7A, uh, came actually much much later. So uh, in the uh, so so this was shown in the in the late 90s, early 2000s actually, when we uh, when we had some um, that was actually shown using not with uh, genetic markers but with phenotypic markers. So it was mm -hmm. done by uh, uh, by Nobuyoshi Watanabe, and he he basically crossed a, a line with uh, I think a. Uh, it was a chlorina mutant, so it, it causes yellowing of leaves, and this is also located in chromosome chromosome seven. And he crossed this line to a polonicome and just measured the uh, uh, recombination frequency between between the two loci. And, and this way, he could show that yes, it's on chromosome seven, and uh, he could give like a rough map position as well at that time. Right. So it wasn't you weren't they weren't able to identify a hundred. No, they years weren't able to. They, yes, but okay. they they recognized. They recognize very early on that there's there's a there's a potential for this and there's this interest, and they, they, they've seen they've seen this very strong one one to two to one uh, segregation, which again hints at at the, at the dosage effect of, of of the gene. So it's it's not that the heterozygotes are uh, you know it's not a dominant effect where uh, the heterozygotes cluster with the the the, the wild allele or the mutant allele, but there's somewhere in between and very very consistently. Great. So have you considered investigating triticale for P1 as well? Although it is a rye by wheat cross, the triticale head looks more like the triticum polynicum. Yes, it does, rye. it does. No, we, 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 have not, we have not uh, investigated triticale at, at all. Um, I mean, rye in general has, I think, slightly elongated glooms and lemmas. In general, that is a, Long, long glooms, long lemmas is, is a is a is a trait of um, primitive weeds to put to put it that way. So as um, so, for example, even even dicocoides has has longer lo longer glooms than than or can have longer glooms than than modern uh, durum lines, for, for example. So I think it, I think it's part of of a of domestication effect that we sort of moved moved away from from long glooms. And I think triticale might be because of the rye influence. Maybe that brings some of that, uh, you know, prim these primitive traits back. But this is just uh, speculation. So it would be interesting to to look at it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So you've shown that the the role of BR2 and ZMM19. Where do these genes fit in a developmental pathway? So. Um, 
as far as we know, so these these genes are, are, are important. So as as the, as the name of the VAT gene suggests, so it's vegetates through productive transi transition. So uh, these genes are important for uh, they, what we think is they they maintain uh, like a vegetative character characteristic uh, in the meristem, and then to, for the meristem to switch to a reproductive function. It actually needs to be downregulated uh, sufficiently, um, because uh, there's some. Again, this work from uh, from Kunli and George Zetkowski. They they propose that um, uh, these SVP genes they they compete with uh, with other genes for binding to um, scaffolding proteins, uh, um, like the. Um, um, Ah, what are called the SEP genes, so sepalata genes. So class E, uh, if, if if you look at the at the standard floral uh, development models, so class E genes, so sepalata genes, uh, they have been shown by by Joseph Hoskins and his group to to bind SVP genes, but they're also very important for uh, uh, for other floral regulators and and regulators of of um, um, uh, sort of reproductive function. So probably as as most of these reproductive genes, they they are continually continually more strongly expressed. So at some point, you can overcome a high level of of SVP expression. But uh, usually, in in in, uh, in like our standard uh, bred wheat, uh, you'd see that ex expression of SPs actually drops very quickly uh, uh, when um, uh, the, the tissue switches to a reproductive stage. Or, and to efficiently produce reproductive organs, you have you have to shut them off. As you've seen, if you, if you just have very high SV, F, <clears throat> excuse me, SVP expression throughout, you actually fail to form uh, spike meristems and, and, and florets, and instead you just make more leaves, leaf, 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 leaf. So the function, it's it's very complex, and the, you know, it's a transcription factor, so it has ma many functions, and it depends where 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 you look uh, at, at at it. So, uh, but it's very very interesting, and and, and yeah, we we we. we we're definitely we're definitely interested in looking and elucidating more more about this role and yeah at different places and in different tissues. Oh, and, that's a good question. Sorry, it was a bit rambling. <laughs> no, 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 no. And in, and potentially in different species, of course, looking at it, you yes. know, from the standpoint of perhaps in barley or in um, you know, one question came up. Uh, does rice uh, long grain phenotypes do do they have any of these genes? That's a really good question, and I, unfortunately, I don't know the answer. <laughs> that would be really interesting to look at yeah 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 so maybe that's someone else will be immediately on that <laughs> start that yeah, research please, please do get get in touch I'll, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what yeah it could stories. be quite interesting so how are you sure that the ph locus is responsible for the the different grain size in triticum dicocum and triticum estivum or are you that this is not my question. So, 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 how much? So again, so we did our. Uh, so when we transformed the what we what we believe is the pick one locus, so the VAT A to B allele of of polonicum, when we transformed this into uh, into hexplot wheat, so fielder, so the complementation study. So I've shown you the data for uh, for gloom length, but we also see an increase in in, in grain length in 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 these in, in these lines. So again. Uh, this this is I think our final our final confirmation that uh, indeed it is this gene that confers the long long blooms and long grains. Of course, there are the other uh, long grain uh, lo loci out there, and I've, uh, I've 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 mentioned the Triticum spahanicum that uh, Andy Chen is, is is working on, uh, but there's 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 more. So um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. You know, you mentioned the, you know, I mean, I'm curious about the dosage effect and mm -hmm. whether you can actually control that. Um, do you see that? I mean, it, because what I think is very interesting is the fact that it's not, it's it's temporal as well as, as a, a dosage level. And as we, I mean, just really thinking outside the box here, as we think about climate change, is that something that that we could tweak to change how the dosage works so that it performs better under certain conditions certain weather conditions for example 
Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so uh, I've shown you so from 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 our data from the uh, VAT2, you know, we've identified these two motifs in the in the first intron. Uh, but again, looking at other SVPs, you know, there were motifs controlling the expression in the promoter. So it, it might it might be a uh, using gene editing for for example. Uh, maybe if you if you delete one of these motifs, be it in, in the promoter or maybe the intron, you you sort of change the uh, expression pattern either spatially or temporally, or or both, uh, and 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 that that might allow you to to fine tune when and where these these genes are expressed, and then in this way create a germplasm that's sort of adapted to to certain regions. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if, if we want if we want to integrate this or, or similar allele in, uh, in, in, in maybe a, a Mexican uh, environment or, or Southeast Asia, we might want to, to tweak it. And I think we, we need to we need to do a little bit more research to understand what these motifs do, what what the partners are, and maybe maybe this just just that that uh, maybe for if if we want uh, a variety uh, in, in Mexico, we delete maybe. The second motif in the first intro. Boom. Okay. Mm. And maybe for Southeast Asia, we we delete both motifs, or we delete something in in, in the promoter. Uh, but we definitely need more more research. But I think I think the potential is there. So so techniques like gene gene editing definitely offer this uh, f flexibility and this precision, right? Not not just right. making uh, telling mutants where you bombard the the genome with with uh, uh, chemicals and you get many mutations. But rather very targeted editing and uh, yeah, rapidly adapting the germplasm to also change the climate conditions, as, as, you, as you say. Right. But yeah, we, we don't understand enough yet to to really make an educated guess what what to tweak and what not, and what, what 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 to leave alone. <laughs> sure. And and I and I noticed it in your next steps. You talked about that's part of the target is to elucidate those genetic networks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We it might be that that we that we don't want to tweak SVP expression, but maybe something downstream, upstream of, of it, which mm -hmm. which has less pleiotropic effects, or, or might be or might be more localized. So uh, the transcription factor is, is active in many different tissues, but maybe it's important that we tweak uh, a gene that is more uh, confined in when and where it is expressed. Right. So the you know one of the things you mentioned in your presentation is the value of the reference sequence. Um, Absolutely, yeah. And as you look towards the future, are there what tools do you think? I mean, I know that's kind of you know, looking out in a science fiction kind of way. What do you, what would you like to have? I mean, it's over the past years we've the the development has been so rapid of, of resources uh, and it's, it's 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 a fantastic time to work to work to work and read um, we quickly went from from the one genome assembly to uh, more more than 10 and I think that's that's definitely where, where, where we want to go to have more maybe not complete assemblies but uh, very high quality uh, data that allows to uh, uh, called, for example, haplotypes. Um, that would definitely be a step in the in the right direction. And of course, I, I think it's it's important to really uh, to uh, capture the diversity that, that that we have. Right. Again, I'm, I'm going back to the gene banks, which are, are just cru crucial for this. You know, it's uh, yeah. screwing away all, all all these land races that otherwise would would have lo been, been lost. Again, I, I come back to Andy Channon's work on treatment by honeycomb. So, uh, this uh, wheat species has been discovered in Iran in the 1950s, but when people came back in the 1970s to to collect more, they couldn't find it anymore. So it was gone. So it only exists in gene banks. So uh, it, it it just shows that if we, it, it's very easy to lose uh, diversity that 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 might be beneficial to to improve uh, germplasm. And then obviously, if we can. Uh, Rapidly sequence th these slides rather than, than rely on on, on uh, mapping projects. If you can just say, okay, these are these are the SNPs. We we can do a QTL mapping, pretty much just from uh, yeah the the reference sequences that we have, or, or yeah, that would be fantastic. 
Yeah, uh, I, think, I think we can't overestimate the value of the gene banks and the work that absolutely. the personnel in the gene banks do to keep absolutely. these alive and to keep access to them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but at the same time, a, a major hurdle for, for gene banks is, of course, that they have a lot of material and there's a lot of duplication there. And again, if we have uh, with sequencing advancing a lot, sequence costs drop, dropping rapidly, uh, it allows more and more for, for, for gene banks to also take better stock of their material and, and maybe uh, declutter us a little bit. And, and, yes. and, and this way also make, make the material easier accessible for research because it can be daunting to simply to okay yeah this the gene bank has thousands and thousands of reads but which one do i pick to to sort of like investigate there's there's, exactly. there's only so many lines you you, you can look at so right. if we have uh better genomic data better passport data for these lines that'll be that'll be fantastic and uh if people you know whenever someone could uh, uh deposit something in a gene bank i urge them to sort of give as much information as possible so uh, so that other researchers can, can can benefit from from, from this. Yeah, but we're very fortunate right now to have a couple of those efforts underway with both yeah. with the Watkins collection exactly yeah. uh, in the UK, also the uh, German gene bank at IPK. Those efforts are underway, and then of course we'd like to to do a little more uh, covering the breadth of the. The diversity uh, of, of the land races as well. So I, I think these are all very critical to to the pathway as we move forward. Well, Nicola, thank you very much for a great presentation and exciting project. And I look forward to seeing where you are a year from now <laughs> and, and the progress that you've made. Um, and maybe it'll actually be in person at a meeting. You know, who knows? Who knows? Maybe. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone for being with us today, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again on our next webinar. Again, I'm Kelly Eversole, uh, Executive Director of the IWGSC, and I want to thank Nicola Adamski from the John Innes Center for being with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.